Sherry Turkle has written several books focusing on the psychology of human relationships with technology, especially in the realm of how people relate to computational objects. In her latest book, she argues that loneliness is at least in part a consequence of digital life and suggests that we're sacrificing conversation in favor of mere connection. Turkle is engaged in the active study of robots, digital pets, and simulated creatures, as well as in a study of mobile cellular technologies. Sounds like me. Yes. In many ways, we are facing a new self. There are two ways in which we're different. First, in my research, I find we'd rather text than talk. There's a kind of flight from conversation. And second, people say, I share, therefore I am. We don't feel like ourselves. We don't really feel ourselves unless we've shared our thoughts and feelings in mobile connection. There's less and less of a boundary between the virtual and the real self because so much of our real self has become performing ourselves online that I think we begin to forget who we are really, really. Internet makes us three promises that we can be wherever we want to be, we can always be alone, and we can always be heard. So it's the self that gets used to having these three promises delivered, and that's a very peculiar way of life. We need to be constantly connected, um, but by being constantly connected, we make ourselves more lonely because what we really can't tolerate, what we really don't know how to do, is have a moment of solitude. So we think we're making ourselves less lonely by being constantly connected, but actually, if you don't know how to have a moment of solitude, you make yourself more lonely because you just are constantly connecting without meaning and you don't feel less alone. And if you don't teach your children how to be alone, they only know how to be lonely. So we give ourselves the illusion of companionship through all these devices without really the demands of friendship. I think that in a face-to-face -face conversation, we can learn more about how to attend and listen to another person than we can in a virtual conversation because we're getting more information about their silences because, and they're stumbling because after all, it's when we stumble and we fall silent and we hesitate that we reveal ourselves to each other. And that's what makes us human. is not that there's anything wrong with online communication. It's great, and it has its place. But it's not meant to be a kind of either-or um, uh, substitution. We know that the Internet is not an anonymous place. Yet when you're alone with your email, and it's dark and it's quiet and the screen is shining, you feel profoundly private, and people share extraordinary things. They forget that they are publishing. Why do people feel that the Internet is a place to share the most mundane details of their private life? I went to the gym, I ate a pizza, and this is the these are the new habits that we've been taught by applications such as Facebook and Twitter, which ask us, what are you doing? What are you thinking? What are you doing? What are you thinking? What's up? 
They keep changing the prompt. What's up? What are you doing? What are you thinking? My quote is from Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said that dreams and beasts are our test objects. And test objects are the ways in which we know the secrets of our nature. By thinking about test objects, we learn the secrets of our nature. And I think if Emerson had been alive today, he would have said that the internet and the mobile devices are test objects. And by looking at them, we learn the secrets of our nature. We're constantly connected, but we're not having conversations. We're being friended, but we don't have friends. We don't have friendship. So it's a, it's a time where we're changing the meaning of words, but I don't think we're getting the sustenance we need.